God. I guess I would just add to that. I um, mean, there's a million different ways we could go from this, but, um, but there are other species that do something like what we do in terms of being uh, social, interdependent, long-lived with childhoods, with generational overlap in which learning is necessary during those childhoods in order to become what they are going to be as adults. And, you know, everyone here probably can come up with some of those examples. It's the toothed whales and the wolves and some parrots, some corvids like crows and jays and great apes and elephants and such, but no one, and, and there are others, but no one else does it to the degree that we do. And so fascinating, you know, your 4,000 year old ancestor versus someone from say 20,000 years ago, probably that 4,000 and 20,000 year old person meeting would feel that there was just a chasm between them culturally, and there would be, but the chasm between that 4,000 year old ancestor and us is far, far greater, despite the fact that far less time has elapsed. And that, you know, that is in fact, one of the things that we keep, that we keep harping on, if you will, is, you know, the rate of change is outpacing even our ability to adapt to it such that um, ever more, we don't even recognize the world that we were born into or you know that college students starting college at the point they graduate they don't they may not even recognize the world that they started college in and excuse me the 4000 year old woman would have recognized her ancestor from 16000 years prior to a better degree than we would recognize her lifestyle even though genetically we're effectively identical yeah what it makes me think of is um you know, it's like the, the, the hockey stick of growth around population, right? That it took us forever to reach a billion and then we stayed there forever and then industrial revolution whoosh, and now we're just going straight up. So I'm hearing you correctly that what you're describing is the hockey stick around the regeneration of software. Hmm. Well, it is the hockey stick, but there is a... Uh, a fly in the ointment, which is that a lot of that change was change that we were capable of keeping pace with. And I guess since the industrial revolution, we have at some point crossed some threshold, which Heather and I call hyper novelty, at which we are no longer, even our amazing capacity to change at an incredibly high rate is simply incapable of, of keeping pace. And uh, Heather hints at it in pointing out that we don't often even relate to the world we grew up in. It's so different from the world that we are adults in that they, um, you know, there's a loose analogy between them. That's not supposed to be the case, right? It can happen in a generation. If you, you know, if your ancestors cross a body of water and find themselves on an island with a strange ecology, they may have a very jarring transition, but then their offspring will know a lot about the world they're in. What we have is generation after generation that by the time they reach adulthood, what they've learned in childhood is irrelevant in large measure. And that is just beyond our capability. And, and part of it, you know, part of it, I think we think could be alleviated with a greater sense of, of place that uh, because we are, we are largely living these itinerant lifestyles in which it is very rare to find someone who is in the place that they grew up or even if they aren't in the place where they grew up, who still has a relationship with that place, who could tell you on December 1st, uh, what the weather is likely to be in the place they grew up if they're not there still. You know, many of us have lost track of even those things. And, uh, you know, one thing I used to ask of my college students uh, was what phase of the moon is it now? Just, you know, just, just right now, you're sitting in a classroom with a big window, but you presumably can't see the moon. And these were, you know, these were crunchy environmentalist uh, undergraduates, and still, um, you know, many of them couldn't, couldn't say. And I think when we do have that knowledge on board at a sort of a daily level, we do have a greater sense of not only the passage of time, but the changing of our own cultural values and how it is that we're proceeding on the planet. So I know that we'll get to a conversation about how we ground ourselves more in a wisdom of place, which I know the answer is not as simple as stop moving. Um, but would you share a little bit? I know that you do some of this in the book, but for anybody that hasn't heard it, you know, just a few stories that offer a window into your own 
epiphany around the importance of wisdom of place and what you've observed and what and why you feel that's part of the key going forward for all of us? Yeah, you, you want to tell the story that we begin the book with? Um, well, I mean, Beringia, is that? No, no, our personal experience in Sarapi Key in Costa Rica. Um, yeah, we could do, we could do that. Uh, Heather and I had an experience. We were working at a tiny little field station in Sarapi Key, Costa Rica, uh, actually very close to the very famous La Selva Biological Station, one of the big, uh, very well-resourced stations. And at this little station, um, you know, we did our work during the day and in the afternoon, it would get hot and we would finish up our work and go down to the river to swim and to wash off. And one day we were walking across the bridge to get to our swimming spot and uh, a local guy, a Tico, stopped us and started speaking and neither of us speak Spanish very well. We speak enough to sort of get by, but uh, anyway, he was very <laughs> animated uh, and, you know, we did what we could, had a conversation with him. And then at some point we politely uh, said goodbye and stepped away and started to head down. And he kind of grabbed us by the shoulder and no, no, there was something he needed to convey. And well, what he kept on saying to us was it rained in the mountains today. And he was, and it was, it had rained in the mountains. We could, everyone knew that you could see that, but it seemed irrelevant to our current situation. We were hot. We wanted to swim. Right. And we had been doing it every day. And it was, you know, along with locals, we weren't the only people swimming in the swimming hole, but he was pointing to, you know, features of the river. And at some point it did sort of dawn on us that what we were looking at in the river did not look like the average day in the river. It wasn't terribly different, but there were eddies that, that we had never seen before. And the water was a good bit cloudier and, um, as we were standing there with him, sort of taking in his view of what we should be paying attention to, the river started to rise rapidly. And all of this incredibly heavy woody debris, I mean, like tropical trees that had fallen into the water, start rushing under the bridge, under the water, popping up over there. And the beach that we would have been swimming on was just completely submerged in a matter of, I don't know, a couple of minutes. And no question, if we had been down there, we would have been swept away. And there's a pretty good chance we would have drowned. Um, so anyway, it was a very good lesson. And we, of course, uh, thanked him profusely. He had, in all probability, saved our lives. And uh, it was a very, I mean, you know, Heather and I are not strangers to flash floods. We grew up in Southern California where this is something that one is told is a fact of life. But in this place, we didn't get it, right? He could see things about the weather in the mountains that we didn't understand. And this wasn't our first time traveling through Latin America. And we didn't think, we'd already been schooled by some experiences. We didn't think we had hubris um, down there. Uh, and, you know, we were there in our first or second year of graduate school learning how to be biologists, and we were studying place. We were st was studying frogs and Brett was studying bats. Um, but here, one of the most simple, simple lessons of the place that we were in, which can be summarized as when it rains in the mountains, stay out of the river. You know, the water's got to go somewhere. When it rains in the mountains, stay out of the river. We had failed to intuit. It just, it hadn't occurred to us to connect those two very obvious things. And without this man and his local knowledge and his care for strangers, uh, we, you know, we might not be here today. We probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, so that's just one very personal case of recognizing, oh, even, even when you don't, even when you think you are there to learn and you are open to experience and knowledge, you may be carrying around some blindness uh, that, that could be the difference between life and death. Um, you are carrying around some blindness and the challenges, which <laughs> figuring out what it is in time. Uh, there are already some questions piling up. So I just want to restate one thing that you said and ask a follow up and then we'll get the other voices into this. The first is, so Brett, I love the way you put this. And of course, I think we started recording the moment after you said it. So, but what you said was, we are a generalist robot platform with a computer on its shoulders that can self-generate new software as needed. I yep. love that. <laughs> and so then in the spirit of what we're talking about now, it sounds like what 
what is most required is like the orientation pack. We need the orientation pack so that we can better be grounded in a wisdom of place that helps us see our blindnesses. Um, I know to some degree, of course, the orientation pack is this book, um, but I wonder in this context, what you would most highlight as the, as the beginning of someone's intention of being, of downloading that particular orientation pack of software. Well, it's ironic actually that you should ask this because in some ways the book could be the starter pack. The book is also explicitly an invitation to something that we call campfire, which you are quite obviously doing here. Yeah. Um, so the point is human being, when I say that the the human robot has a computer that can auto generate software as needed. There is a software package that does that. And the software package is one you're already familiar with. You just don't know what it's for. It's called consciousness and consciousness. Isn't what the brochure says it is. Consciousness is actually primarily about the space between individuals. It is an intersubjective phenomenon, a very real one. Now, we don't study it that way because you can't put a group of people into an fMRI machine and get a scan, right? So it's not something that's easy to measure. But if you think about it, you know, if I say, um, you know, potato bowling ball, right? We could, we could prove that everybody who heard me say it actually gleaned that abstraction correctly by asking you to draw pictures or whatever. And the point is that means that we are setting up a space where we can all lodge abstractions and we are not kidding ourselves to imagine that they have actually been passed into that shared space, right? That's consciousness, that's collective consciousness. And what collective consciousness is good for is solving any novel problem because you could try to solve it on your own and you might make some headway, we all do that. Um, but you'll be much better off if a group of people who have different blind spots and strengths, different experiences, pool their toolkits and they create this space. Presumably this would have happened around a campfire in a traditional setting and say, hey, you know, all right, uh, the, the uh, food that we were counting on is not working out. That creature is not as plentiful as it's been in years past. What does look edible around here? And, you know, somebody could say, well, those little things look edible. And somebody else could say, Yes, but the amount of time that it will take to get enough of them isn't worth it. These other things are a better bang for your buck. And so that conversation in which people hold each other's feet to the fire, try stuff out, all with the purpose of enhancing the capacity of the lineage, that's the campfire thing. And uh, I don't know, you know, I don't know the history of your group, but it's pretty clear that that's what you're up to. Sorry, I muted myself. Um, yeah, so in a way then, I wonder if what is required at all of these campfires, let's say this campfire is our particular honeybee colony. And, and so what you're calling for is the hive mind and a slightly different sort of waggle dance where instead of just waggle dancing our way to point out where the next home is gonna be, we're trying to waggle dance our way towards a shared consciousness that sets up a different relationship between us, one another and the natural world. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, it does. And, you know, we, we can't, we shouldn't make the mistake of imagining that anything that anyone in the, in the tribe or the hive or the group or the community, whatever you want to call it, um, comes up with that, you know, any idea that looks forward as opposed to back is a good thing. There are certainly many bad ideas, and that's part of what the, the tribe is for, is to help ferret out which ideas are good and which aren't. Um, but also having people who not just have memory of the, you know, the lived past um, that people who are still living can actually remember to, you know, in an in a slightly older time to remember things like the hundred year flood and where it went and where the safe ground is, you know, things like that. But also the you know, the evolutionary lens that we introduce and talk about throughout the book provides a framing so that you're not simply imagining, oh, that hunter-gatherer on the African savanna, that's the thing that we're adapted to, 
right? That's not the only moment that we're adapted to it. And yes, it, you know, it shows up in the title of our book, but you know, we say early on, I think, we equally well could have called it an agriculturalist's guide to the 21st century or a post-industrialist's guide to the 21st century. Or we could go backwards in time and say it's a, you know, it's a primate's guide or a mammal's guide or a fish's guide, right? Because all of these things, we, you know, we are fish, in fact, um, and we are mammals and we are primates and we are hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists and post-industrialists, all with you know, nested sets, ever, you know, ever less time, and they're, you know, they're, um, they're going forward in time. But we are adapted to varying degrees to each of those moments. And those group memberships will never change, even as we may be better and less well adapted to those particular moments in time. You know, we will always be mammals, even if we lose our fur and our mammary glands and um, you know, our forward-facing eyes, um, all of which sort of diagnose mammalianness, but we can't change our history. So we wanna understand as much about our history as possible and simultaneously recognize how completely flexible and software-based and biased humans are compared to all the other species on the planet and recognize that that's our strength and also part of how we got ourselves into the modern mess of creating so much novelty and so much change that it's hard even for us to keep up. I know Kim in New Hampshire has a question. I'm gonna to come to her in a moment, but I'm also wondering because this group is not only here to ask questions, is there, something that somebody wants to add to the conversation so far that you feel will kind of deepen the well. Uh, hearing none. Kim, what question do you have? Well, I, I actually think that Brett and Heather were just talking about the answer to my first question which was how collective consciousness leads to cognitive emergence. That's my summary of it. And I think that's what you're talking about. I think Bobby's question that she put in the chat is probably the next best follow-up. So I'll save my other one maybe for a little later. But Bobby, do you want to say your question out? I'll... You can. You keep going with it. <laughs> Follow your thought. <laughs> Follow my thought. Well, she just said it feels important to rethink education when we consider the need to collectively face together challenges of living and loving. Um, and, and so what are some ideas for that approach? And certainly the two of you have been in the thick of that question in, historically. Um, well, there's so a lot to say. <laughs> there's a lot to say on the yeah. topic. Uh, to fast forward it, I think um, it's pretty clear to us for various reasons, in part because the teaching environment that we had at Evergreen when we were professors there was so different from the normal environment. And in fact, what it did is it provided us complete freedom to teach whatever we wanted to teach in whatever way we wanted to teach it. And it created uh, a very intense interaction between professors and students by basically students took one class at a time full-time, professors taught one class at a time full-time, and those classes could go on for a full year, they could go into the field, they could go abroad. And that's a, that's a very different model than a four credit at a time college lecture. And so in any case, what this revealed to us is that teaching is all done wrong. And that basically we have forgotten that human beings are built to learn, they learn automatically given a subject matter that is ancient enough. The things that we need school for are things that are modern enough that you would not figure them out on your own, like chemistry, calculus, even writing and reading. You will learn to speak automatically. We can't even stop you from learning to speak if you just simply have people speaking around you and your ears work normally and your mind works normally. But we have to show you the alphabet and tell you what about the letters and and do other things to help you read and write and calculus even even uh, more to the point but so anyway the point is school is a supplement it is not synonymous with learning right learning is a much bigger process and what we ought to be doing is facilitating learning and we could understand this process really well learning should be so so rewarding that people can't stop themselves that they don't even know when they're doing it right it should be games and experiences and uh other 
I don't even know what to call them, exercises that do not feel like drudgery, that simply make you want more until you've gotten all of the things out of it that you can get, at which point you'll be eager to go on to the next one, right? That's, that's how it's supposed to work. And we're just doing a terrible job because we have a classroom model that's built around um, an ancient job of passing on knowledge, knowledge which is now freely available to everyone, and that's built around economic efficiency, having one person efficiently teach a bunch of people at a time. And the fact and is it's freeing up the time of their parents to go generate economic value or something, something like that. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's just it's it's not a good model. And we're holding on to it for reasons that don't even amount to nostalgia, just basically because people don't know how to ask the question about what we should be doing instead. What, just to add one thing to that, you said, and we've both said this before, school is a supplement. And it struck me for the first time that this is actually true in an, you know, that we can analogize that to food supplements as well. That um, for the most part, if you are eating a diet that in which you have, you know, you've grown your own food or you're shopping the edges of the market or you're growing it from the farmers who grew the food, um, you shouldn't need, you shouldn't need to pop pills in order to get individual micronutrients uh, of which you are deficient, except that. Um, even if you're doing all the right things, our soils are uh, impoverished now, and you know there there are toxins and things, and you may need to have you know detoxifying supplements in order to deal with some particular thing about the place you live. And so supplements are increasingly actually necessary for many people in modern environments to deal with modernity. And school is a supplement to all of the learning that humans do anyway, in part to deal with modernity. Yeah, this is actually, I wonder if we continue to chase this thread, if we would see this again and again, because yeah. basically the point is the critter in the environment for which it is built doesn't need a whole lot of forcing it into things. It basically intuits its way through life and it gets enough of what it needs because it's programmed to. And modernity is the thing that causes you to have to supplement. I think we're likely to come back to this question of education because I know there's a lot of educators on the call, but um, the the beautiful unbounded spirit Ani in Santa Barbara has both a question and a request. Ani. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have to go back and look at what I wrote. Well, you, in particular, you were wondering about the the relevance of living systems, but I just know that you'll be able to ask that question okay. in a way that is perfect. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, I'm listening for the language of life because I'm always looking for the language of life and what life is and how I am as that. And when I hear the language that you're using, it, it's, it, it sounds mechanistic to my ear. And it's hard for me to relate it to natural systems. I understand perhaps a little bit, the evolutionary biologist of, of culture and uh, uh, whatever you're focusing on. Um, I wonder if you could speak to consciousness of nature. Um, I forget the last the last word that you said, but anyway, it's like we're here to become more alive and liven up our systems. How can you inform us of that? Let me say something first yeah. and, then, and then let you go. Um, I will say that one of the drumbeats uh, in, in our lives and in our book is sort of anti-reductionist and anti-metric. And uh, you know, as scientists, using numbers, using quantification when valuable and necessary, but never conflating the numbers with uh, mistaking what you have measured for what you maybe should have been focusing on instead. And what what we say in the book, I think, is that complex systems, which are exactly exactly what you say, they tend to be evolved, and um, the ones with which we are most familiar are are full of life uh, at every level possible, are often misunderstood um, by modern successful people 
as simple systems. And that's not the word, that's not how they would describe it, but effectively it's an engineer's approach as opposed to a biologist's approach to understanding systems. And an engineer's approach assumes that you can go in and describe A, therefore B, therefore C, and voila, we got our thing. There were static rules, there were static conditions, and we can always and forever end up with the result we want if we just do the preliminaries that, that we are prescribing. And part of what we're saying as evolutionary biologists is everything in evolution is context dependent. We are, we are alive and we are changing our environment as we move through it. And therefore there can be no, um, you know, there can be no most fit. There can be no best strategy. There can be no, none of these things that are absolute, um, absolute strategies for all time. Uh, precisely because we are we are modifying our environment as we move through it. Um, I think I hear your question pretty pretty easily, and I think I know what you're trying to ask. And um, one thing is, I think you have to understand, at least with me, and maybe with both Heather and me, you're probably dealing with somebody who's um, the way we arrive at the subject matter is probably different than you. And, you know, for me, I know I am obsessed with trying to figure out how these creatures, which are far beyond any level of complexity I will ever be able to understand. And I know that walking into it, I like to figure out how far I can get. And it sounds to me like your orientation is the kind of person who will find that frustrating. But what I want you to know is that I was riding my bicycle home with my son from school today. And it's, uh, you know, it's obviously December 1st here. It's cold. We We're ran across Portland, Oregon. some crows, right? Now, I know that most people would bypass crows and they would barely even notice that they had seen them. But I also, when I see that, I look at it and I think that's as close to a miracle as you could get, right? The idea that this creature self-assembles and flies around, and not only that, but it has cognition and it can solve problems and all of these things. I know that that is an incredible marvel that I can only barely approach. And so here's, here's what I think a person like me needs to say to someone like you, so you'll figure out that we actually experience something similar on the inside, okay? Here's, here's a terrible truth. Every evolved creature has the same purpose. And it's a terrible purpose, right? It's absolutely unworthy of us as it would have to be, right? If malaria has the same purpose you do, then it's not a good purpose, right? But- And, and the purpose being just make more of yourself. Yeah, to get your genes yeah. into the future, right? That's the purpose. And it's a terrible purpose. It has resulted it's best in- uninteresting. It's It's awful. But nature in pursuing that purpose has given you the most amazing machinery conceivable. And it has also made you capable of all kinds of strange things like compassion and pursuing beauty and recognizing it and appreciating it and decency and morality. And all of those good things are the result of that incredibly stupid purpose. And so my point to you would be, if you can see that and you can understand you know, if you were to sit quietly, you could figure out, well, actually, that has to be true. Then the next question is, all right, if I'm a robot that knows that I have a stupid purpose, but I have incredible machinery capable of wonderful things, how can I take that machinery and remove the old purpose and supplant it with a purpose that's worthy of that machinery, right? That's really our argument in the book about what we should be doing is recognizing that we are robots on a dumb mission that we shouldn't honor and we can do something better. We can decide that our purpose is to enhance life for other humans. We can decide that our purpose is to make life on this planet possible for as long as possible. We could decide that our purpose here is to enhance the amount of biological diversity that persists in our midst. All of those things are worthy goals. And so, you know, if you take the annoying mechanistic way of looking at this, and then you get to the philosophical interaction with it, you end up somewhere like that. That's more or less what I think. If, if I may, um, I think I hear what you're, you're saying. And, and I understand that. that, that I, mean, I mean, I think I, I understand what you're saying. My, my question or offering 
is that that's already embedded in the biology of our nature to me. It's in mine. It's, it's, a, it's one of several competing things. And I think, I hate saying this, that's but I true. do think it, it needs to be said. It is competing with some terrible things. And so in a sense, if we can stand back and say, you know what, the appreciation of the beauty of nature, the wonder of it, the appreciation of the comfort we take in each other, that is one of the things that humans naturally do, right? It is not the only thing humans naturally do. In fact, humans naturally make war and commit genocide and steal and all of these other things. And the point is, okay, do we want to forever be like bouncing back and forth between the good things we do and the bad things we do? Or do we want to say, all right, Let's choose. How do, we, how do we make a system for ourselves that causes us to default to that good mode and to avoid that other one? That's just what I was going to say. Ani, my name's Maureen. Um, I, my question, I guess, is that piece about- and Real quick, Maureen, and, I, and anybody, no, that's all right. And anybody else, when you come in, just because it's fun, like also tell us where you are in the world so that sure. everybody can get a sense of just how global we all are. Yeah, go ahead. Here, city, baby. Okay. <laughs> I'm not from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Brett's originally from New Jersey, but spent 20 years in Washington, D.C. I'm originally from Berea, Kentucky, in the foothills of Appalachia. And I lived in Olympia for four years, too. We also lived mm -hmm. I applied to Evergreen and got accepted, and probably if it had gone, would have failed out. <laughs> but anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, so grew up in Berea, Berea Kentucky, and if uh, I, I'm one of the people that has a place, right? I had a place as a child, and it's still a place. Um, that's a whole other thing. But so so Ani says she's that kind of person, right? She's a person that it's built into our biology to be kind and supportive and all of these, you know, cosmically wonderful things. Um, but our and there are plenty of human beings on the planet that. I would say are oriented in a way that Ani is referring. We are not very good, I don't think, as a species of producing system, complex systems that serve a non-destructive role. And yes. I would say the opposite of that. I would say that we're very good, even in our most well-intentioned manners, mannerisms to create systems that are highly dis highly complex yeah. and also highly dysfunctional and extremely dangerous um, for all living earth, living things on earth and also ourselves and our, you know. Yeah, let me, survive. let me add one thing at this point, because Brett, you actually, since you have the same name as me, you actually asked my question and I want to direct it in a certain light. So the thing that we study over and over again in my class is Pareto's law and you know why does Jeff Bezos make 321 million dollars a day and Steve over here makes three dollars and 21 cents a day and forests are like that too you know the biggest trees in the forest take 97 percent of the light and and all that stuff uh as you said it's, it's very bad it's very destructive it's it's basically what a virus does but then we also have this driving need for egalitarianism and uh charity and and all these things are we just dumb? You know, are we like banging against each other? The, 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 the process that actually gives us life versus the process that gives us humanity. Um, the I guess the nugget of the question is I've always asked this question about scalability. I'm a director of a public uh, title one urban Montessori school and it's not scalability. It's the, it's the, how, how do we create systems that as you said, Brett, are do this other thing that we're not, I don't know. Yeah. So before you, it's not just Sam, scalability, I, but it's also I, persistence um, without the charismatic leader. You know, like most of us can probably imagine creating a system that would work with a particular person in charge, but what happens at the point that the, that wait, the power transitions? Sam, may I, may I add a, throw something into the mix here? Yep. But you have to tell us who you are and where you are. Oh, yeah. I'm Jessica. I'm in Philadelphia. Um, Fellow rabble rouser. Just right. turned 65 on Saturday. So, congratulations. <laughs> um, 
I am finding this conversation so human centric mm. and it really is, is getting under my skin. Um, I have one tattoo. It's a, it's a octopus. There's been a lot of news lately about octopuses, not octopi and um, other invertebrates, non-vertebrates. I'm not sure what the category is. Um, this is so fucking human centric to me. And I feel like it's so arrogant that it's really pissing me off. So I'm just throwing that out there because we are not the only and most important organisms on this fucking planet. No, we are because we're no, about, we're to, make, we're about to make it uninhabitable for the others. Well, that's true. So, so it's about time we got. I used feel to the like power we need we to bring in like the rest of the fucking, you know, I had a couple drinks. I apologize. It's You're all right. 52 in Philadelphia right now. Um, but I feel this so passionately. We cannot be human centric on this planet anymore. We just fucking can't. Well, okay. So how do you address that? Right, but you, we, you, we can't, but the school system. Well, I know, one, you even talk to me about the school uh, system. Oh, Maureen, because, Maureen, and, Maureen and Jessica, yeah. love you both. Let's we, let Brett, let's let Brett okay. have a response. Yeah, and uh, Maureen, I'm with you and I love Berea and I've been there and we should talk independently sometime. Okay, so I want to address that last thing first because it just it's going to be the elephant in the room unless unless it's done. Um, it is quite possible to have a discussion about the priorities that should accompany life on Earth and try to make it not human centric. The problem is that we are such a dominant force on this planet that you immediately run into us in some major capacity <laughs> just by virtue of the fact that we are literally liquidating the well-being of the planet for no good reason. In fact, the reason we're doing it is because we're programmed to do it, but we're not supposed to have tools at this level of power. So we're using sort of an ancient program to capture whatever resources, and we're using modern tools to do it, and it's a disaster. Uh, it's a slow motion train wreck, right? I must say, I started there many, many years ago, decades ago. I have abandoned that mechanism for waking people up and i have decided it is much hey, better actually what do you to... mean by that i'm not sure what you mean by that what sorry I mean is, what i mean is um one can say that the other creatures of earth have a right to be here too and i get it right i like orcas as much as the next guy more in fact i will go farther i will i will i will do things others won't in order to see them i will hike deep okay. into the woods to watch monkeys, whatever it is, right? Not to see orcas, so it's not that I don't get sake. what these creatures are, and it's not that I don't appreciate them on their own terms. My credentials are good in this regard. However, the orcas are going to go extinct, right? The monkeys are going to go extinct. They're all going to go extinct. In fact, we're going to go extinct. That's guaranteed, okay? Now, we could say, well, but we, they have a right to be here as long as they can be, okay? All right. Does that apply to houseflies? Probably. Does it apply to Anopheles mosquitoes? Ooh, now we're in trouble, right? Because Anopheles mosquitoes transmit malaria, which kills a lot of people, right? <laughs> so maybe Anopheles mosquitoes don't have a right to exist. And maybe SARS-CoV-2 doesn't have a right to exist because we probably created it. But does SARS-CoV have a right to exist? Yes. It does? Yes. So, but now, but now, now well, where are we? They all do. Everything does. Do. Uh, does smallpox, should we bring it back? Yes. It cool. does. All right. But then this is a conversation I'm no longer interested in. My feeling is no, smallpox has no right to exist. What? It's for it's one thing, it doesn't organism. care. It doesn't care. It's a robot without a computer. So are it we. doesn't care whether it exists, <laughs> right? It's just programmed to get into the future. I'm and if we want to get into the future, we need to stop it. I'm not sure that we are any different. Well, okay, but my feeling is this is a Pascal's wager situation, right? I don't know what that means. What it means is that if, if we take your word for it, that smallpox has as much right to this planet as we do, then a lot of people get smallpox and suffer and die. And if oh, we right. take my approach, the, the risk is that smallpox human. goes extinct. 
Well, but how do we have more of a right to exist than anything else on this planet is i guess my bottom line question well we could how is it, it that humans have more of a right to exist than here. anything else on this planet you've just argued that smallpox ought to be something that we ought to be protecting <laughs> just, okay no so my, my point is that's that's how far the the view that you have outlined gets us before we run into a major conundrum with a huge amount of needless suffering okay now i would argue if you go the other way right suffering and you, in fact, for who and, say, and actually i i want to interject here if i can just because there have been some some comments in the chat too um this we need to ensure that this conversation stays as a conversation among the the whole group. Yes, I apologize. I so, I, so I, I I'm wanna, getting a little I, passionate I here. Sure we, I want to make sure that we keep the circle as wide as possible. So Brett, uh, I want to let you finish what you're saying, and then Stephanie, I'm particularly interested what you're thinking about based on what you've heard so far. So in a minute, I want to come to you and see. What if anything you'd like to to tee up for us? But sorry, Brett and or okay. Heather. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna mm -hmm. finish off the thought. If you don't go that route and you in fact reverse it and you say, actually, I'm okay with being human centric, right? You quickly get to the following place. Human suffering is bad. Human flourishing is good. Being a human is a value that we are morally obligated to provide to as many people as possible. And that means life on earth has to become sustainable in order for there to be an indefinite number of generations that will come after us to enjoy the place. If we liquidate the creatures of the earth, then the life that we will provide to those future generations who inherit the place from us will be an impoverished life. So we don't have a right to eliminate orcas, even if we're human centric. For human centric, the point is those orcas need to stick around because you don't have any right to rob future generations of them, right? So you can cleanly draw a distinction between smallpox and orcas if you do it that way. And my feeling is actually I have yet to see the flaw. If we decide that human life, liberated human life on a pleasant, habitable planet in which you are not uh, enslaved to somebody else's objectives, if that's the goal, then you end up protecting all of the stuff that I'm sure everybody in this conversation would want protected. You have to. So I will just, I will add that um, Brett and I aren't exactly in the same place on this. I think we both started in the same place and I'm closer to where we started. And, you, and as you said, as he said, you know, he has moved to this position that sounds very human centric and it's actually, you know, your, your logic is that this ends up doing the job um, that I think all of us here agree that we want done, which is preserving sort of a maximum amount of, of wild nature, among other things. Um, but for many of us, myself included, even though I track the logic, it is at a level of abstraction that is so removed from my experience of, you know, today, I was outside walking by the river for many hours, and I saw many species of birds that I haven't seen for a while because I haven't been able to get out there. And everything about my experience now, including the things that I'm thinking about, that I'm going to be writing about, that I am, that are completely abstract, is improved as a result of having been there. And so I am, I am driven by the non-abstract. I want to make that available to everyone maximally and not, not argue that they need to be dealing in the abstraction first. I think, I think you are probably right. I, th I, don't, oh, I don't find a flaw in the logic, um, but for instance, at the level of education, um, you know, and especially the younger the children are, the, the more so, um, you, know, you, don't, you don't lead with the abstraction, you lead with the, get your hands dirty. Right, you know, play play with the bugs I don't know and discover where, the things. I don't know where the abstraction was in there. I don't know what future generations are gonna make of orcas, but the point is it's not mine to choose whether they get the choice. So I'm not imposing that they have to view it the way I do. By, by the way, I just want to, a, a few things before we go to Stephanie. First, I want to acknowledge it's at the top of the hour. Brett, Heather, 15 more minutes. Would that be sure. okay? Yeah, just absolutely. so we can, and obviously if people have to drop off at the top of the hour, that's great, but I will wrap us in 15. This conversation reminds me of a book I want to recommend and the author will be a guest here in the future. 
It's called Fathoms by an Australian writer named Rebecca Giggs. And the subtitle is The World in the Whale. And it is a beautiful look at not only the history of the human relationship with whales, but what that says about who we are and where we're going. And it is just amazing. So read Fathoms, that's A. Um, then B, uh, I want to um, actually, why don't I just come to Stephanie now and, and invite um, her to offer some thoughts about what she's heard so far. And Stephanie, I'm offering you the space to offer thoughts with the underscoring and the permission that it doesn't need to be profound or like summing everything up. It's just like out of curiosity, I just want to tap you on the shoulder and be like, what are you thinking? So Stephanie, what are you thinking? And you're on mute. And you're still on mute. How about now? Oh, okay. now we're yeah. Uh, well, I'd, I'd say thanks, Sam, but you put me on this having a friggin' clue what I'm thinking. But with that, um, I'm really struck by the, um, uh, I, I don't know if dichotomy is the right word or the, ten the tension with a capital T between um, the right of certain forms of life to continue, even if their purpose is destructive to human life. And so that seems to be um, a conversation that is perhaps worth having at another time. I, I don't see it as, as, as at this moment, but I, um, I guess what I'm wondering um, for Heather and Brett is, um, uh, my orientation is to uh, live between worlds, if that's the right word, of for now, which is the being very present. So I'm speaking not only of me, but I guess I'm talking about our species, if you will. So for now, we have to be thoughtful and sensitive and wise and all of those things, uh, and the world of what is possible. And be, for me, between the, the realm of for now and the realm of what is possible is the space of mystery. And so I'm just with my, in my own musing here, listening to what is really a powerful and provocative conversation and thank you is um, to both of you. I think we have, we have an understanding of for now. We have made a mess of the natural world. We are in Seed and Spark, we're trying to deeply understand the dynamics of living systems. So we can say, how might we use their attributes to uh, develop generative, life-affirming, regenerative systems that will really bring human systems, certainly schools and children alive. Um, but we're all, I'm also interested in your view on given all of this, what, in your view, what is still possible? Where, where are we now? Would do you have in your mind, it sounds simplistic, a, um, a course correction, um, a way to say, here are the conditions where you can shift if you ask the following questions, if you engage the following, mm -hmm. if you use a new lexicon. So I'm kind of blabbering here but it is what i'm it is what i'm holding so thank you sam <laughs> and sure and um Brett, heather i'm going to suggest actually that let's have this be the final question for you and then there's going to be a way that we can all close together um so i guess i'm not sure what level one i'm not sure what level you all are having that conversation at um, we have been involved in a conversation about the fact that humanity is clearly off track, that our current trajectory is likely fatal and relatively near term. And there's certain things that we can say, you know, uh, we in our 
uh, Hanukkah celebration have repurposed it since it's not really a major holiday. And anyway, we've repurposed it and we've put uh, a principle for each night of Hanukkah. And actually the first principle uh, for night one is that human endeavors need to be both sustainable and reversible. So this is uh, effectively our highest priority long-term. Now, if you make your own life sustainable, it's not going to change anything, right? It doesn't change humanity's trajectory. So in some sense, I think, unfortunately, and some of the pushback I think we're getting here is that there's a desire for what can I do, right? But actually the answer to what can we do is an answer that is going to take a certain amount of devotion to architecting a new system. What we say in the book is that what we are looking for is an architected steady state system that liberates people. We know that we do not know enough to blueprint it from here, that the right way to get there has to do with navigating and prototyping. It does not have to do with blueprinting. It can't be done. We literally do not know enough to do it, um, but that it is conceivable. And I, the last thing I would say is my sense of where we are is it is late, but it is not too late. There is plenty to salvage. And the, my biggest fear is that we could salvage it and won't. Thank you. So good. I'll go, I'll go a different, different tack. I agree with all of that. I'll go anecdotal and experiential here. Um, in January of 2020, we was the last time that we were in the Amazon, which is one of our favorite places to be in the world, the Western, Western Ecuadorian Amazon, which is understood to be perhaps the most, well, it is, it has been measured to be, take that as you will, to be the most diverse habitat on earth most biodiverse habitat on earth. It's utterly extraordinary. And there's a field station there to Patini, uh, which takes a full day of travel, uh, mostly by motorized canoe down several tributaries of the Amazon to get to. And you arrive as dusk is falling and you know, there's electricity a couple of hours a day. Uh, and there's cold water that is pulled from the river that you can use a shower. And it is really truly divine. We were there to finish writing the first draft of this book, in fact, just for a um, week and a half or two in January of 2020. In fact, emerged and went to the Andes for a few days before flying back home to Portland, Oregon to our boys to, to hear for the first time of SARS-CoV-2. So that's, that places it in time very, very clearly. When we were there and the, last, the previous time that we had been there was a few years earlier, it would have been uh, 2016. It's the last time we'd been there. Um, Things were already changing. We could already we could already see as people who have been working in neotropical rainforests since the early '90s um, that things seemed different. That diversity was different. Of, for instance, uh, several species of birds. And there is there are long term researchers there who have been begun to track what is what is happening. And yes, say absolutely that you know the birds are declining. And I can just add this yeah. is in a place so remote that aside from people associated with the field station, one can go a week and not have any evidence that there are other people on earth, literally to the point of nobody flying over, no boats go yeah. by on the river. It's that far away from, from civilization. It's ancestral Warani territory. Uh, and the, the, you know, the Warani who are hunter-gatherers were always um, thin enough on the ground that although they still do live in the area, um, you don't run into them very often. Uh, and, and yet on this trip in January, 2020, um, we were at an oxbow lake uh, where you can see Watson, which are these extraordinary, they're sort of like bird cows in the trees. Uh, they're fermenting, they're foregut fermenters and they smell terrible and they're bizarre looking and you know, you'd never even imagine them unless you've seen them in one of these crazy little lakes in the Amazon. And we're looking at these Watson in this oxbow lake and we hear a human noise and it's, an oil platform from probably 20 or 30 miles away, as it turns out, I don't remember exactly as the crow flies, not that there are any crows there, as the Watson flies. Um, but even four years earlier, there had been no oil refineries there. And you know, we can go back through the history and talk about the various poor decisions by the various Ecuadorian politicians and the, um, the Chinese interests and the US interests and all of this that contributed to now they're opening up the Ecuadorian Amazon, literally the most biodiverse spot on earth to oil refinery. Um, but there's nothing that we can do um, about that particular thing, nor um, do you know the number of insects was so diminished um, that we were now 
we were now seeing the number of birds very much diminished, specifically the insectivorous birds. And the best answer that we came up with, and that was also ag agreed to by the few other researchers who were there, was that um, this is likely due to widespread non-localized, non-localizable effects of neonicotinoid insecticides um, that are, are being dispersed nowhere near there. There's, there's no agriculture for hundreds of miles of where we were in the Western Amazon. So there are insecticides that are at levels traversing the planet that no individual um, can do anything about. And so then we go to, you know, what, what can we do systems wide uh, to deal with the very real experience of boots on the ground. My God, where did the insects go? Where did the birds go? Why are we hearing an oil refinery at this deepest spot in the Amazon? Uh, I will point out there's another layer to this particular story that I think points to the exactly the problem. So the president of Ecuador, pa past president, past president, uh, controversial guy, but um, quite interesting, attempted to prevent the oil drilling in the Amazon. And he attempted to do it by saying to the world, look, this isn't really our Amazon. This is Earth's Amazon. And you need us to protect it. And we want to protect it. But it doesn't make sense for the Ecuadorian people who are not a wealthy population to pay to protect the world's Amazon. So let us raise, and I've forgotten how many billion dollars it was, in order not to have to drill here. In effect, let's replace what the Ecuadorian people have a right to extract from under their territory and not extract it you know, without punishing them. He asked for the wealthy nations of the world to pay Ecuador, Ecuadorans not to extract the oil underneath the Amazon. Right, and it was, uh, it was the right solution to the problem. And of course, the world said, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. And so we're now drilling there. And so the point is at some level, we, as much as nobody really wants to be, you know, we all want to be thinking about what's cool in the Amazon. We don't want to be thinking about oil platforms there. But in some sense, if you want the Amazon to be cool, you have to think about the game theory around oil drilling and economics and, you know, what happens if you divide the world into countries and people over there who are never going to see the Amazon don't really understand why they should be paying to protect it. Right. This unfortunately is the conversation and it is very human centric, but um, you know, the other creatures aren't going to be able to solve the problem we're causing. We have to, we have to solve it. So obviously there's tonight has been like a series of fireworks of ideas and <laughs> provocations. So it's safe to say you have a lot of um, things shooting up all around you. Um, so for that first, I just want to say thank you to Brett and Heather for coming and being a part of our community tonight. We're really grateful to have had you here. And, and I think the best way we can show our gratitude is uh, let's, let's close. I know we're right at 9 and 15, so maybe just two or three minutes. But um, if you were to offer to the group and to Brett and Heather a single idea shard, either it's the thing that is now stuck in your side and you're going to be wandering away wondering about it, or it's the final bit of wisdom that you want to offer the group. And here's the thing, people, the only way this works is, you know, bonus points for a clause, you get no more than one sentence. Your sentence is not allowed to have more than one comma. Like this is not a, this is not the time to offer your your graduate thesis. It's just so that we can get as many voices as possible. Let's end with the the idea shards that we're taking away that we offer one another. Kim, you want to start, and then we'll do it Quaker style. So I'm not calling on people after Kim. You lead with getting your hands dirty. How might, yeah. how might organizing um, model, modeling help a mechanistic view? What's your next step? What, what have you learned from this conversation? If we all die off, the water bears will still be here. <laughs> Dave, I, I, see, 
I've seen you, Dave, trying to get in, but you're on mute, just so you know. Critical thinking, problem solving, learning by doing. We as science teachers need to get back to that core set of things to do. Going once. What do you, what, what do you want um, your children to know? If you were telling them, I don't know how, I don't remember if you told us how old they were, but what is the bedtime story that you want to become part of the narrative that they hold forever? Beautiful. My mind is completely shifted. Ani, I saw you trying to get in there. We evoke from the quantum field what we're looking for. Let's focus on creating what works yeah <laughs> <laughs> going twice thank you both so much uh let's it's a useful reminder that there is no way around the fact that for the world we envision, urgent patience is required. <laughs> yes. Uh, great to be connected to you, Brett and Heather, and look forward to staying connected to you in the in the weeks and months and years ahead. Thank you. Indeed. Keep up the good work. Uh, we do not mind having our feet held to the fire. We appreciate that too. And I, I will leave you with uh, our favorite Hopi saying, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Oh, yeah, yeah. Fuck yeah. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Thank you all. Everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.